Hello everyone. This story is about, what if godlike Naruto was able to feel other people's emotions and fall in love with Mei and Anko? Please like, share and subscribe for more. Also check the other fics I've uploaded. Now let's start. Yagura, or Uchiha Bito, was frustrated. For the past two weeks, he'd been receiving constant reports of how there were two children destroying his bases around Mizu no Kuni. They couldn't tell for sure, but they were almost positive that they belonged to the resistance. It annoyed him that the outlaws had acquired two powerful allies. They were more trouble than the entire resistance combined. He had been fighting the bloodline lovers for years now, and never before had they gained such strength. He didn't really care about the stupid country at all, but the fact that he was being toyed with by two kids made him a little bitter. Who were these demons of the resistance, and why did they show up now, out of the blue? It wasn't that he cared what they did to Kiri, but if they were good enough to mess him up here, they may prove to be a threat to his real goal. The Akatsuki was still in its recruiting stage, and they were not ready if they needed to start this soon with the Bija hunt. They had a few incredibly powerful members, but not enough to ensure they could take on every village if they needed to. Madara had drilled the idea that being too careful didn't exist. You could never be too prepared, and if he let these two children live, they could grow into something too powerful for their exclusive organization to handle. He wanted to stay in Kiri to handle the problem himself, but he was needed a name. He'd have to program Yagura to kill the threats himself if the opportunity presented itself. If he knew where even one of them was, he'd swarm them faster than bees to honey. He really wanted those two dead. Having his men tell him that they were being slaughtered by adolescents was beginning to annoy him. It was time to end this little problem. A swirl in the air around him heralded his leaving Kiri. It was time to check on the God of Rain. The first thing he noticed was the warmth. Not the unpleasant, hot summer day warm. No, it was far from that. The warmth he was experiencing was the kind only another body could produce. The kind only someone you trusted could give you. It was intimate and innocent all at once, and welcoming, very welcoming. The gentle rise and fall of his warmth's chest against his back was the second thing he noticed. It captivated him, the pressure applied to him every time she took in another breath. The feeling was both firm and soft. Such softness shouldn't exist in this world. It calmed him, like it was his own personal paradise. He wondered if many others had felt this very same slice of heaven. It was his favorite spot as of this moment. How his body was tangled with his warmth was the next thing his mind picked up. Their legs were touching, smooth creamy flesh meeting his own tanner shade. Her legs were longer than his, but they were still able to intertwine them together. Hers were as soft and smooth as her chest, if that was even possible. Auburn hair lay sprawled out on the bed, brushing his shirtless back. His warmth's arms were completely wrapped around him, locking together in a safe embrace. He could feel her warm breath on his neck every time she exhaled, reminding him just how warm she was. If he could, he'd stay like this forever, but that wasn't something either of them could do. Both of their tasks were much too important. Their countries needed them. He gently broke the lock of her arms and untwined their legs, earning a groan of displeasure. He chuckled, she obviously liked their close slumber as well. Just a while longer, Naruto Kuen. The sleepy Kunoichi mumbled, wanting to stay in her comfortable spot for as long as possible. After his little chat with Jiraiya last week, Naruto had told me his real name. He knew she was someone he could trust with that little secret. He could feel and understand anyone he wished just as much as they understood themselves. He knew that Mei actually cared for him, even if she wanted to care for him on a more romantic level. She had respected his decision of not wanting to have sexual relations with her, which relieved the blonde greatly, and agreed to having just a closer than most friendship, which included, but was not limited to, sharing a bed. He was happy that she wasn't offended that he didn't want to have sex with her, and that she was okay with their relationship as it was. The last four days had the resistance and Rohan waiting for the right moment to strike the weapons factory. They knew that there was a monthly shipment plan, where the factory would send the newly created kunai and shuriken to Kiri, which was the perfect opportunity. Shio was a larger village than most, and timing was crucial if they intended to pull off a clean hit-and-run operation. In the small time they had to relax, Naruto had spent the majority of it with Mei. They spoke a lot about what would happen with Kiri and all of Mizu no Kuni after Yugura was dead. The woman had many ideas for her country, which included peace treaties with the other nations. She had no wish to ever have to plunge her birthplace into war again. 
They had suffered the effects of war for too long already. Another topic they discussed was Naruto's incredible power, or as much as he was allowed to tell her, which wasn't much. He had explained that like Jiraiya, he was a sage, just on a more potent level. He told her that he was born with his abilities, and had joined the ANBU when he was six, which shocked the woman greatly. He was the youngest assassin she ever heard of. It was incredible and so sad at the same time. We have to get up now. He said softly, resisting her cute pout. Or do you want everyone to find out that we sleep together? He frowned. With Saru and Erosenin, we'd never hear the end of it. That wasn't something he was looking forward to. He wanted to keep whatever intimacy he had, with anyone, as far away from his fellow Sanin as possible, or have his private life become the man's newest porn book plot. That wasn't something the blonde would appreciate. May sighed in defeat. She knew they needed to get up before everyone, or they would find out their innocent enough secret. They weren't doing anything in her room, just friendly spooning, but neither of them were delusional, no one would believe them. She had no problem sleeping with Naruto, sexually, or just for the warmth and company, but she didn't want everyone knowing it. She wasn't ashamed, she just needed her private life to stay private. She was the leader of the resistance after all, and she needed to keep her powerful and deadly Kunoichi reputation. I really wish you were older. She sighed. If you were, we wouldn't need to hide, she paused, whatever this is. She really wished they were closer in age, or at least that he was a little older so that they could have some fun together. Naruto returned the sigh. Sorry. He chuckled. I didn't have any control over my conception. He gave another chuckle, this one dry and humorous. I don't even know who my parents were. May gave the blonde a sad smile. That was another topic they talked about. Neither of them knew their parents. In Naruto's case, he wasn't even allowed to know who they were. May's father had died at the beginning of the Third Shinobi World War, right after May was born. Her mother had died a year later, leaving the woman all alone in the world. Well, I guess I can forgive you then. She replied, stretching herself against the large comfortable bed. Ever since Naruto had joined her in sleeping, she had been able to sleep better than ever. It saddened her that he would have to leave, she would miss his presence and warmth in her bed, which was much too big for only her. Good. Naruto smiled. I wouldn't want you to be mad at me for the rest of the time I'm here. He said, also stretching. After the two got dressed and left one at a time, they returned to their places among the others. Saru was oblivious, as was Jiraiya, but only because he kept undressing the females of the resistance with his eyes. Damn perv. Nico, however, knew that something was going on between the two. What it was, she had no idea, but something was definitely happening. She held her tongue, though, knowing that she could risk her command. She didn't want the most powerful operative in her squad, in her village, to see her as nothing more than an annoyance. Karasu knew as well, it was obvious to him. They went off to sleep at the same time and Nozumi never slept with them. How everyone else hadn't figured it out confused him, but like everything else, he stayed quiet. He didn't like to pry into anyone's private life. That sounds like overkill to me, kid. Jiraiya said uncertainly after his godson had explained the new plan to hit the factory under Shio. We need to send the Mizukage a big enough message so that he'll show up himself. Nozumi replied, smirking underneath his mask. I don't think anyone can ignore that. Jiraiya had to admit that, if anything, his beloved student's child was imaginative. Even he, the great Toad Sage, author of the greatest book series in the Elemental Nations, couldn't come up with the idea Nozumi had. It may have partly been because he didn't have the power to pull it off, without his godson, but that was a moot point. Yugura was definitely going to show up in Shio, and once he did, he would die shortly after. I agree. May spoke up at her side of the table. If this doesn't cause him to show up, then I don't know what will. She finished, giving Nozomi a small smile she thought only he saw, but having Niko and Karasu already knowing what to look for. It was clear as day to them. So when does this little play of yours begin? The Gama Sanin asked, folding his arms in front of his chest. Because I have things that I need to do. He added, giving Nozumi a look only he would understand. My presence is needed elsewhere. The blonde nodded, receiving the message with ease. We should be ready to strike tomorrow, if all goes as planned. Nico replied. She was eager to get back to Kanoha, she missed her lover. I'm guessing we'll be out of Mizu no Kuni in a couple of days. Nozumi knew what Nico was feeling, and the woman knew he did too. 
She knew he didn't try and snoop on her emotions, he was just born able to feel others around him. It was still somewhat embarrassing though. He knew how much she craved to be with Hayate. Hey While she wasn't trying to hide their relationship, it was still awkward for her that someone knew her private feelings. If anyone, though, she was glad that it was the young blonde, because he never used it against her, or teased her about it. He let her feel the way she wanted and never brought it up, which she was eternally grateful for. Once this little factory is destroyed I can leave, right? Jiraiya asked with his gaze set on Nozumi. If the boy hadn't told Nico that they had a very close teacher-student relationship, then she would have been bothered by how much he directed his questions to her kohai. Yugura should be dead after that, so I won't need to be here anymore, right? Nozumi could tell that whatever it was that his sensei needed to attend to was something very important. He knew his fellow Sanin was a pervert, always peeping on women for his newest porn novel, but he also knew that the man was a master spy, providing information for Kanoha on a regular basis. In short, he was a busy man, and the war in Mizu no Kuni, no matter how terrible it was, wasn't his problem. Nozumi shot Nico a look that said sorry, which was strange that she understood it, considering they were both masked. Correct. Once Yugura shows up, we can take it from there. The Uzumaki said, reassuring his sensei that he was free to go after the raid. He was upset that the man had to go so soon, they hardly got to spend any time together anymore. They were both very busy, Nozumi with his ANBU missions, and Jiraiya with his spy network. Okay then. The Sanin said with a smile. We're all good to go. He clapped his hands twice for good measure. One dead, Mizukage, coming right up. He yelled a bit too cheery for May's liking. He was a bit too happy about ending the life of a Mizukage, for her to be comfortable with. She would have said something about it, but then remembered what Naruto said, how they were both Sanin. May knew that Jiraiya was powerful, the man was a living legend, but she hadn't known just how powerful. The images of Naruto taking out Black Harbor raced through her head, she never wanted to fight something like that. Even if he did say he was more potent than the older man, even half of the power she witnessed that day would be terrifying to go up against. She made the choice to just let the old man be, not wanting to risk it. She wasn't scared of Jiraiya, she was just logical. If she tried anything with him, no matter how close she was to Naruto, there wasn't a doubt in her mind that he would crush her to save him. It might hurt him to do so, but he would. The boy was a Kanoha ANBU, through and through. His people mattered the most, above all else. That was one of the reasons she liked him so much, despite his young age. We'll attack early tomorrow morning, right when they're loading the boats. When Nozumi and Jiraiya Sama are done with the first wave, the resistance will come in for a second. Nico continued. My team will be set up around Shio to help the escape. Here, she looked at Nozumi. That's when your last part comes in, Kohai. Nozumi nodded. He knew what was going to happen, and he knew that May hated it with a passion. She knew how strong he was, and that he could take care of himself, but it would be almost like they were abandoning him, something she never did. The plan was simple, do something that Yugura wouldn't be able to ignore, destroy the base, hightail it out of there, and leave Nozumi behind. Once Kiri captured the boy, he'd let them take him to the hidden village, where he would do what he did best, eliminate them. All of them. Get some good sleep everyone. May ordered, giving the blonde another warm glance. You're going to need it. She finished, ending the meeting for the day. The two Sanin sat in the elder of the two's personal lodgings, speaking in private. They couldn't speak about certain things in front of the others, even the other members of Team Ro. Are you ready for the other reason you're here, Naruto? Jiraiya asked in a low and serious voice. This was something only he and the Hokage knew of. It was the most important secret in Kanoha, even more so than the secret child of the Yandame. If the other nations realized what was happening, they would be furious. It would mean total war, with Kanoha at the center, besieged by all other nations. I am. Naruto replied, once again in the presence of someone he could be himself with. I'm not worried at all, it should be as easy as last time. He reassured the Sanin. More importantly, when am I going to see you again? He asked with a frown on his face. You hardly ever come around Kanoha anymore, he folded his arms across his chest. I miss sparring with you. Naruto hated how well Jiraiya could read him, the Sanin could tell what he was feeling almost as if he had the same abilities as him. To prove his thoughts, Jiraiya gave him a knowing smirk. Sorry about that, Gaki, but you know my work is important. He sighed. And you're not in Kanoha all that much either. 
he added, causing his godson to chuckle. I guess that's true. Naruto agreed. Neither of us have enough free time. He added. He loved his job, it was the most important thing in the world to him, but he did wish that he had more time to spend with his precious people. You should quit the ANBU then. Jiraiya said sarcastically. Naruto narrowed his eyes and smirked. Or you should quit your spy network. He retorted. The room was silent for a moment, before they both busted out in laughter. They each knew that they could never quit what they both loved doing, which was protecting and serving Kanoha. After a few minutes of laughter, the Senin finally calmed it down just enough to talk to one another again. In all seriousness though, if you do encounter some kind of trouble, dash, the Senin was cut off by the blonde with a wave of his hand. Naruto could already tell what he was going to say. It warmed his heart that the man cared so much for him to actually worry about him, but it wasn't necessary. He could handle anything that came his way. He wasn't cocky or arrogant, just confident in his abilities. He stopped being challenged by Jiraiya a year ago. He was sure he'd be fine here. I'll be fine, sensei. He said again. I won't be alone. He touched his stomach and smirked. I'm never alone. He finished, causing Jiraiya to return the smirk. Minato knew what he was doing, sealing the QB inside Naruto was an extremely smart move. No one before Naruto was capable of harnessing the greatest of the bijou. Not even Kushina, with her special chakra and chakra chains, could control the chakra entity. And yet, her son could at such a young age. It was amazing. I guess you're right, kid. I never really thought about it that way. Here, Jiraiya rubbed his chin with his right hand. You know, that's really something you should be proud of. He smiled at his godson. I know I am. His smile grew when the boy's eyes widened. He knew the blonde always treasured the compliments he got from him more than others, for whatever reasons. Probably because he always treated the Uzumaki like an actual kid. After Naruto spent only a few seconds to recover from the kind words, he gave a heartwarming smile. Thank you, Jiraiya-sensei. He brought his right hand to the back of his neck. I really appreciate it, coming from you. He added. Jiraiya nodded. Both Sunni knew the other, with great detail, even without the blonde's special skills. They had a special relationship. Naruto could feel how the Sanin cared for him like family, which was odd for him at first, but he quickly enjoyed the warm, familial feeling coming off of the man. Jiraiya himself had the, sometimes annoying, ability of reading him like a book, which, admittedly, brought a smile to his face. They were both Sanin, capable of feats no other shinobi could accomplish, so they could both understand each other in a different way. Even if Naruto didn't know it yet, they really were like family. She could feel the sickening mark on her neck flaring with pain. Great, it was going to be one of those days. Mitarashi Anko had been trying to have a nice and peaceful day at home when her curse mark started acting up. Her roommate, Yuhi Kurinai, was out on a mission with her not-so-secret secret boyfriend, Sarutobi Asuma, which made the apartment all hers for the next couple days. She liked being alone sometimes, just to get away from it all for a while. Kurinai was one of her few friends in the village that she could trust with anything and everything. When she returned from that bastard Orochimaru's island, where he tested her and then dumped her, she had been a little ostracized for her involvement with the Hebe trader. A few years had passed and she was re-accepted into the village after proving herself to be loyal. And now, she was just another Kunoichi of Kanoha. No one saw the snake when they saw her, and she liked it that way. After Orochimaru, she had another problem. She liked to dress a little more revealing than others, which she only did to better express herself. It wasn't like she was some slut who'd sleep with anyone interested. Somehow, though, that was exactly the reputation she had built up. Anko was by no means a virgin, but she'd only slept with a total of three men in her entire life, and each one she had tried her best to date. It wasn't her fault that the relationships never lasted very long, men just couldn't handle her. She was wild, and liked to experiment when she did get a boyfriend, which she thought guys would like. She chalked it up to them just being pussies and held her head up high when they'd tell their friends how freaky she was in the sheets. That was a reason why Karinai was one of the only people she could trust, the woman would always keep what she said a secret, even from Asuma, and never judge her for what she said. After the three guys didn't work out, the snake mistress wanted to see if a woman could keep up with her desires. That was a dead end as well. It seemed like there was no one in the village who could satisfy her needs and be with her in an actual relationship, which she wanted. 
She didn't want just casual sex, she wanted a man, or a woman, to come home to and rest, in their arms, or they in hers. Something, just someone that she could count on like Karina, but also have fun in bed with when it's that time. She didn't think that was too much to ask for. Today was a day of relaxation, a day to just push all of her worries and problems to the side, but that was now being ruined by the damn curse mark on her neck. It seemed that whatever she did, she was going to be miserable. She would always be stuck in this nightmare that was her life. She would always be alone, in pain, and depressed. She was not one of those girly girls, but right now, she wished someone would come in and sweep her off her feet like a princess, just this once. She wanted a prince, a knight in shining armor, to come get her, to come savor her. As she lay on the floor, clutching at her neck as the tears poured with the amounts of pain she was in, both physically and mentally, she whispered four words that no one would hear, but the wind. Someone, please save me. Like always, she was left by herself, crying in agony, waiting until the pain stopped. It never really stopped. I've been thinking. May trailed off as she lay next to Naruto in her bed. They were in their innocent intimate position again. It was already time for them to get to sleep. They needed rest for tomorrow's op. Have you kissed a woman yet? The blonde could feel her excitement and hopefulness. I have not. He answered, a perfect poker face, hiding his amusement. Why do you ask? He almost laughed. He already knew why, and the woman's excitement increased. She really liked him. Well, I know you don't want to have sex, but... She trailed off, blushing slightly. That was new. Whenever they were in bed, May had always been. Aggressive, and not really shy at all. Now the woman was all kinds of embarrassed, but still excited. Very excited. Hmm? He asked, trying to get her to say what it was that she wanted. He already knew, but it was funny to see how nervous she was. She really hoped he didn't decline this offer. And if it was for what Naruto thought it was, he was most likely going to say yes. He might as well have something to show for his time, with the powerful Kunoichi. If you would like to kiss me. She said it as a whisper, and Naruto would have made her say it again, like he hadn't heard it, to play with her a bit, but didn't have the chance to. His lips met hers so quickly, that neither of them had the chance to react. He didn't know how much his body really wanted the auburn-haired woman. He pulled back soon after, a sheepish look on his face. Uh. Sorry. He said. I don't know why I dashed this time he was cut off when May smashed her lips to his, going in for seconds. They were so soft, he momentarily thought, like the rest of her. If all women were this soft, then he couldn't age fast enough. He really wanted to be with one now. It was the woman's time to pull back, giving him a smile. Don't apologize, just keep kissing. She said somewhat breathlessly. He laughed. The woman was really excited. Oh well. Might as well have a little fun. Kissing wasn't something he was against. Jiru and Nobora were currently on watch duty. The two Chunin hated to be assigned so early, but today was a big day. The shipment to Kiri was today, and nothing could go wrong. And with the demons of the resistance, everyone was a little on edge. Do you think they'll come here? Jiru asked, fear evident in his voice. Jiru was the younger of the two, with short brown hair and the traditional Kiri Chunin uniform. Noboru had shoulder-length black hair and the same uniform as his younger comrade, except his gray flak was unzipped. The man's grin showcased his shark-like teeth Kiri was so famous for. Don't get paranoid on me now, kid. He scolded. Now's not the time to be shaking in your boots. He rolled his arm, trying to pop his shoulder. If they do show up, we'll be famous for killing Mizukage-sama's most hated enemies. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful idea? Noboru always was delusional. That does sound good. He said, tilting his head up to dream about all the women they'd get to sleep with if they were considered heroes. Jiru was also delusional. When his eyes met the sky though, they widened in horror. He dropped the kunai he had in his hand, and he slowly began to point at what he saw. Ten minutes before. The Resistance and Team Ro made it to Shio five minutes prior. May and the rest of her people were speaking to Rohan. Nazumi and Jiraiya were a little ways away, with the white-headed man in a lotus meditation stance, and the blonde standing behind him with his hand pressed against the older man's back. Nazumi had the ability to transfer chakra, even natural chakra, into another person. After spending so much time training with his godson, the boy had taught him a thing, or two. 
With some effort, Jiraiya was able to reduce the time it took him to enter sage mode. He also no longer needed to rely on Fukusaku and Shima to assist him while in sage mode. When time was an issue, and he needed to enter the enhanced state, Nazumi could funnel natural energy into him. So all the Sanin had to do was stop the intake when he felt it was balanced with his own physical and spiritual energies. It cut the older sage's time in half, making entering sage mode extremely easy. He still kept his toad-like features though, he was stuck with the imperfect version. It didn't take long for the two Sanin to rejoin the small army, in their respective sage modes. May almost bought, they looked nothing alike. The only thing similar were their eyes, and even then it was minuscule. Both of their irises were burning bright gold, but Jiraiya's pupils were a horizontal bar, and he had an orange pigmentation around his eyes. May now understood why the man was called the Toad Sage, he resembled one to an incredible degree now. We're ready. Nazumi said, nodding to Nico. We'll get into position. Nico replied. Give us two minutes before you start. Nazumi and Jiraiya nodded their heads. It was about to begin. My men are ready. May informed. We'll hit the base the moment your wave is complete. She finished, giving Nazumi a nod. She was still nervous and disliked the part of the plan that left her favorite blonde alone with the tyrannical murderer. But it was a necessary tactic. No one besides him could handle taking on Kiri and the Mizukage at once, and he didn't want to risk losing one of his friends. It may not have been all that long since he came to Mizu no Kuni, but he already considered a lot of the resistance his friends. It was hard not to when you could understand everything they felt. Nazumi returned the nod and was about to say something before they got the signal that Niko, Saru, and Karasu were in position to help pull off the escape. He sighed in annoyance but signaled back nonetheless. You ready, kid? Jiraiya asked. This op was his and Saru's idea, and it wouldn't work unless the blonde was spot on. He knew it was pointless to ask, his family was always ready to bring a little chaos. Or in the blonde's case, a lot of chaos, he never did anything without giving it his all, or most of it. Nazumi was silent for a few seconds. In the next moment, he took his mask off, a vicious grin on face. Let's play, sensei. Noboru followed Jiru's hand into the air, trying to get a look at what terrified him. What he saw was. Like nothing he'd ever seen before. Senpo, Cho Otomarasa and Terengan. Was all they heard, and the sun was blackened. The sight was enough to cause Jiru to wet himself. What the hell was going on? A hundred blonde boys, all looking alike, were falling from the sky like heaven's warriors, each with an extremely large blue spiraling sphere in hand. Nobora was somewhat of a sensor, so when he felt the whatever it was falling down upon him, he was able to appreciate the power that was going to definitely kill them. When they drove their spheres into the ground, which just so happened to be right above the weapons factory, it felt like Armageddon was unleashed. The damage done was enough to completely rip the earth apart, exposing the large building beneath. Naruto laughed. It was a deep, vicious thing, and allowed his partner to do his part. Senpo, Cho Otama Rasengan. The Sanin shouted, driving his own large sphere into the exposed building, destroying everything under it. Naruto could hear the screams form within, and it excited him. He hadn't played for days, and this was the first time he'd ever played with his fellow Sanin. It was fun, like they were a tag team, slaughtering their prey with effortless skill. He heard May's battle cry, signaling the resistance to move in. He smirked, time to show the woman he made out with last night why he called himself a monster. Karama, you ready to join the fun yet? He thought through his link with the mighty QB. He couldn't see the giant fox, but he knew there was an equally vicious grin on his face as well. He had his answer. May was cutting down the men and women in her path with practiced skill, trying to get to Naruto. He had said she was in for a big surprise during the fight after their activities the previous night. She didn't know what else he could do to surprise her at this point, but she was really eager to see it. What else was he capable of? She had to know, she was fascinated by him. That's when she saw it. A giant red beam shot up into the sky, originating from the blonde. There was an actual pressure being forced on the shinobi in the area. The air was suddenly thick, and several degrees warmer. Everything was silent, until the bloodthirsty roar rang out in the rubble. A version 2 Jinchuriki was what emerged from the red-black sphere that appeared after the beam had dissipated. The shockwave from that thing managed to throw many of the ninja away. 
The roar itself put many on their ass, and some even passed out from the incredible fear the killing intent was causing. May's heart had never beat so fast and loud in her life. In the ruins of the factory stood a miniature Kyubi no Kitsune, in all of its version 2 glory. The white eyes pierced into her soul, freezing her to the spot. That's when the demon did the unthinkable. It smiled at her, finishing off the unbelievable action with a playful wink. Had she seen that correctly? Did a demon jest? Tease her? Naruto roared with laughter, which was incredibly terrifying for everyone around, it being so beast-like and deep. She had asked for it when she started the teasing. He was the heavyweight pranking champion after all. He couldn't forfeit his title, just because he met a pretty girl. With a burst of speed so great that not a single person could track him, he was gone, letting Kurama take over for his turn. It was only fair that he could come out to play as well. Cold awe ran through Saru when he felt the Kyubi's presence join the fray. Karasu was indifferent, having been up close to the ungodly powerful feeling of rage and hate. Nico sighed, shaking her head in exasperation. Did her Kohai really need to let that monster out? Wasn't the one underneath the mask more than enough? She knew he liked to be fair, with his little friend. That would never get easier for her to say. It was an awe-inspiring shock that a child could harness such great power. But to call the strongest of the bijou his little friend was somewhat unnerving. He was speaking so casually about something that the entire world feared, like it was nothing more than the norm. It probably was the norm for him, which was why it was so unnerving. Another large spike of the Kyubi's power could be felt. He really wasn't holding back all that much, was he? Nico sighed again. Her kohai really needed to learn the meaning of restraint. Again, another huge spike was felt. What the hell was he doing over there? If Mei hadn't spent all of that intimate time with him, who she now knew was the Kyubi's Jinchuriki, she would have been terrified to the point of retreat. What the boy was doing right now was. Slaughter. He was massacring the Kiri forces. There wasn't really any need for her, or her men. Even Jiraiya had taken to watching from the sidelines, his face not expressing any emotions whatsoever. The Sanin had never seen the destruction his godson could cause, but he always knew it would be something on the scale of what he was watching happen to the Mizukage's men. If Yugura didn't show up with this, the man was either not right in the head, or really didn't care what happened to his people. Jiraiya highly doubted he could dismiss this, even if he was one of the two. A Jinchuriki couldn't ignore another Jinchuriki, and one was right in the Mizukage's backyard. He had to come, and that would be his downfall. It was only a matter of time now. Another powerful beam of carnage shot from the version 2 Naruto, this time in a random area. He knew the young ANBU operative hadn't lost control, he just wanted to provoke Yugura into showing up as much as possible. Firing death rays off at random places was the closest thing the water shadow was getting to an invitation. After Mei recovered from her shock, she huffed. The cheeky brat was playing with her. He knew the plan didn't need the resistance at all, but he, for some reason, decided to lead a teasing crusade against her after the first time they'd slept together. After that, they had both been in a playful game of back and forth, trying to make the other blush or, like in this case, shock them. She hated to admit it, but he had won all of their future battles of wits with that one little wink. He really was the self-proclaimed prankster god, he said he was. When the smoke settled and the last Kiri loyalist fell, Naruto released his version 2 transformation, still smirking at the world. He could feel how the others looked at him now. They were scared of him before, but now they were absolutely terrified of him. He didn't mind all that much. It was the Kanoha-born people he didn't want to fear him. The resistance had nothing to fear from him, but he couldn't really blame them, he probably did look like a demon. Okay, I get it. He heard May's voice, coming up from behind him. You win. She added, in a not-so-pleased tone. Naruto smirked again. He was very proud of his achievements. He then felt something that made him nervous. She wouldn't bust the both of them, for the sake of her pride, would she? Tarumi May brought her face to his in a passionate kiss, right in front of Jiraiya and the rest of the resistance. She would. Damn. He really got to her with that last gesture, if she would do this in front of the most perverse man in the world. Let it be known that Tarumi May was not a person to go down without taking her opponent with her. He could already feel the old sage rearing up. Great, this ought to be fun. Not now, Arasenin. He said before the pervert could open his mouth, to say something that would make everyone there uncomfortable. 
I can feel someone on their way here. He announced, his sage mode increasing his sensory range. They're powerful. He continued, slipping out of May's reverse hug. Incredibly powerful. He added, taking the mask off his belt. Jiraiya became serious. Good. This wasn't the time to mess around. He and the resistance needed to get out of there right away. Be careful, kid. Jiraiya said, turning his back to regroup with Rohan. I'll see you soon, I promise. He finished, taking off, not turning to face the closest thing he had to a son. Naruto knew though, Jiraiya loved him, and hoped he'd be okay. It wasn't necessary, but it felt good nonetheless. He was about to walk into the ruined factory, to wait for the Mizukage, when he was stopped by a soft hand. You better come back alive, Naruto Kuen. May whispered, embracing him again from behind. If you don't live to be old enough to have sex with me, I'll kill you. Naruto thought his sleep buddy's logic was flawed, but didn't speak his mind. Instead, he broke the warm embrace, walking forward. He stopped before he jumped in and slightly looked at her over his shoulder, putting his mask back on. When he was masked, he jumped into the rubble of the underground building, not caring what was coming for him. May would never forget what he did when he paused. The smile on his face actually managed to make it feel a lot colder than it was. He terrified her. And she loved it. Yugura had disembarked from Kiri, the second he felt a Jinchuriki's presence. So that was how they managed to bring so many of his bases down. He wondered for a moment why he hadn't been able to feel it before now, but decided to ponder it at another time. His enemy was practically begging to be caught, like they wanted him to come and collect their heads. That was fine with him. It was time he put the fear of the Mizukage in the resistance. He'd have fun with this one. He didn't care if they were children, if they were old enough to kill, then they were old enough to die. That was the shinobi way. That was the Chidori no Sada way. The way it was supposed to be. Back at the hidden resistance base, a nervous May was sitting in her room, alone. She had virtually left someone she had been close to behind, allowing her enemy to capture him. She had seen what Naruto was capable of, and yet she still worried about him. The blonde had been someone relatively new in her life, but he had already secured a place in it. It was strange. Why was she so drawn to the boy? It wasn't until their rather satisfying makeout session that she realized that she felt a little more than lust toward the young ANBU. It confused her considerably. Not only was he a lot younger than her, but he was from another village. Relationships between two people from different nations never really worked out very well. She knew as much, but her heart kept telling her that she wanted something more from him. Right now though, all she wished for was his survival. He may have been the most powerful shinobi she had ever seen, the stuff of legends even, but he was still just one person, against an entire village. The odds were not in his favor. She hated herself for retreating, she really wanted to be by his side right now. She may not be as strong as he was, but she was a Kage-level Kunoichi to be sure, capable of going head-to-head -head with some of the world's greatest ninja. She knew that she could help him, even if just a little. Anything would be better than just sitting here, in a bed too big for just herself, and doing nothing while someone else was off fighting her battles for her. She wasn't horribly prideful, but she did have some, and letting another do her duty, didn't really sit right with her. Her mind was made, she was going to go help Naruto. He didn't need to face this enemy alone. She made to get up when there was a knock on the door. She sighed in annoyance, but composed herself immediately after. She couldn't let this affect her judgment. You may enter. She called out to her slightly unwelcomed guest. She thought it would either be Ao, coming to inform her about another trivial matter, or Saru. The man kept pestering her with date proposals. It was annoying. She didn't care one bit what the monkey-masked man wanted. Naruto was the only one she was interested in. So she was surprised when Nico, the Kanoha ANBU captain, came through her door. Naruto had told her that he somewhat hinted to his captain that they were a little friendlier than most friends would be with each other, and apparently the woman wasn't too thrilled about it. May had thought that the cat might have a thing for her blonde, but he had quickly told her that she had someone back home, and only worried about the age difference between them. She didn't really think that the conversation they were about to have would be a fun one. May-san. Nico greeted. I would like to talk to you about something. She added as she walked into the room, to stand in front of the leader of the resistance. What would you like to discuss, Nico-san? She asked politely. 
It couldn't hurt to play nice, hopefully the woman would show her the same courtesy. I'll be blunt. It didn't look like they would be speaking politely. I don't like what you're doing with my kohai. She stated bluntly. The woman really didn't know all that much about subtlety. May chuckled. You don't even know what we are doing in here. She retorted. If we're doing anything at all. She added. And even if we were, it's none of your dash anything she was about to say was cut off by the purple-haired woman's dismissive hand. I don't care what you may or may not be doing in your free time. Nico stated. I still don't like it. He's far too young. May opened her mouth to defend herself, but was stopped by the ANBU woman. Let me finish. May narrowed her eyes, but held her tongue nonetheless. She might be special to Naruto, but this woman was one of his people, his family. He'd kill her without a second thought if she did anything to her. I'm not here to berate you for your wrongdoings. May raised an eyebrow. Nico then sighed. She obviously didn't like what she was about to say. I'm here too. She paused. She really didn't like what she was about to say. I'm here to put your mind at ease. May's eyes widened. The woman was actually trying to calm her? I don't understand. She said in confusion. I thought you didn't like me. It didn't make sense, the woman was trying to help her with her internal struggles. I may not approve of your relationship with my kohai, but I, too, care for someone very dearly. Nico admitted. I know what it's like to worry about them. May nodded slowly, not knowing what else she could do. It was a bit awkward to sit with Naruto's senpai and talk about him like they were lovers, which they, unfortunately, were not. If my precious person was in Nizumi's position, I'd be worried sick. She continued when the auburn-haired woman stayed silent. With my kohai though, she gave a small, whisper of a chuckle, you have nothing to worry about. Naomi was thoroughly confused. What was the woman's angle? At the leader of the resistance's confused face, she elaborated. He's capable of much more than you've seen so far. Again, the woman was shocked. Any more powerful than what she'd already seen would be entering the realm of impossibility. Was Naruto even human still? She had her doubts. I appreciate your kind words, Nico-san. She finally spoke. You've made me feel a little better. I still think you shouldn't be in a relationship, whatever that relationship may be, with a ten-year-old. May's smile quickly vanished, replaced with a frown. He's mature for his age, Nico-san. She replied in a sickly sweet tone. Nico cocked her head to the side. He's still a child. Nico replied just as sweetly. May clicked her tongue. She wouldn't get anywhere with this woman. She was too set in the mindset that he was, physically, ten. His mentality however was much older than that of a ten-year-old boy. He was wise beyond his years, and thought like an adult. To her, he was older than she was, in mind, at least. She couldn't wait until he was older and more grown-up looking. She knew he would be a knockout, and couldn't wait to witness what he would do in his life. He was going to change the world, one way, or another. Well, if that is all you have to say, I'd like to be alone now. May stated, ignoring subtlety, like her guest. Nico nodded and left the room, having said what she came to say. She really didn't like whatever was going on between the two, and she had finally said what was on her mind while reassuring the woman that she had nothing to worry about. She found herself smiling under her mask, she was hanging around Nozumi way too much lately. The reason she was smiling was, because she thought that if anyone, May should worry about Yugura. He was about to meet a monster. And then he would die. Shimura Danzo was the second in command of Kanahigakur no Sato. He was an old veteran, and best friend and rival to Saratobi Haruzen. This very man was in the Hokage's office for his weekly private meeting. They discussed many things in these meetings, from recent events to important foreign matters. At this very meeting, Danzo was bringing up their little issue in Mizu no Kuni. We need to react to the Mizukage's blatant disrespect to Hai no Kuni. He repeated, his voice, the only thing heard in the Hokage's office. If we let his transgressions against us go unpunished, we will look weak in the eyes of our enemies. Hiruzen sighed. This was always how the man reacted. He thought there couldn't be peace among the hidden villages. In his eyes, Kanoha was the greater and all the other nations should bow their heads to them. It was hard to handle him, and even harder not to have him around. If Sarutobi was the light, then Danzo was the darkness, and they needed to coexist in order for the village to survive. 
There were things that the Lord Third just couldn't do, necessary things to protect his people, which Danzo was more than willing to accomplish. It was all for the sake of the village and her people. It is being taken care of, my friend. Sarutobi stated. Danzo looked at his longtime friend and raised an eyebrow. Oh? His voice was laced with curiosity. Who did you send, Hiruzen? He asked, wanting to know who the god of Shinobi sent to Mizu. He had thought that his Hokage had become too soft, unable to make the right decisions, for Kanoha. It was very rare for the aging man to send in a team to end such an important man's life without being forced by him and the village elders. I've sent my shadow to shine our light upon Kiri. Danzo understood the cryptic words. Word of a child with the power greater than the five Kage serving under the Hokage in his personal ANBU unit, Ro, began to spread a year ago. It was just a rumor, but Danzo knew better. He and the elders were given confirmation that the boy actually existed, but his identity was still kept from them. They weren't happy about it either. Such a strong child should belong to all of Kanoha, not tucked away in the soft man's pocket. Danzo had thought the boy's gifts would be wasted with his old friend. That's why it surprised him so much when he was told that the boy, whoever he may be, was in the field, taking the life of a man who needed to die for Haino Kuni to prosper. I must say, I wasn't so sure you'd wield him properly. The Warhawk said. It's good to see you're using your tools properly. A rare small smile ghosted his face. For Haruzen, it was the opposite. A frown appeared. Our shinobi are not tools, Danzo. His voice showed the power he was known for when he was younger. You'd do well to remember that. He finished, lighting the tobacco pipe he had taken from his desk with a small katanjutsu, or what he called a simple flick of his fingers. Ah, there's the professor I used to know. Danzo chuckled softly, which would have been incredibly creepy for someone who didn't know him as long as Haruzen had. It would seem that your shadow has brought back the warrior in you. The Sarutobi couldn't help but smile at those words. It was the truth. Naruto, or what he and Team Ro now referred to as his shadow, had brought back a piece of him he thought was long lost. When he began training the blonde with Kakashi and Jiraiya, his body felt old and weak. After the first two years however, his body felt like it was in his prime. When you train with someone like Naruto, it's impossible not to get back in shape. I was shown that I'm far from the incompetent old man that so many see me as. Hiruzen said. He hadn't felt this good in years, and he no longer felt like he needed to rely on his teammates to help lead the village he was chosen to command. It is good to hear you say that. Danzo stood as he spoke. This village needs the man who was given the moniker, God of Shinobi. With that said, the leader of the foundation left the Hokage's office, content on letting the Lord Third finish the job. If he could do what needed to be done, then, there was no need for him to get involved. Danzo needed to remember to properly thank the shadow of Haruzans, the boy had brought back his friend. Rattling chains was all that could be heard in the streets of Kirigakure. The Kiri people watched as the Yande Mizukage, in the company of two hunter named teens, escorted what looked like a child in a Kanoha ANBU uniform. Rumors of the demons of the resistance were even heard by the civilians. It was kind of hard to keep something like that a secret for very long. Most of the inhabitants of the mist secretly hoped that the boy was not who they thought he was, because they wanted to be freed from the psychotic Kage just as much as the bloodline users. He was a terrible man who cared very little for his people, sacrificing his shinobi like they were little more than livestock. It was so sickening that most of the people who sided with him did so just to save their lives. There were a lot of loyal followers, though, and they were just as sick as their leader. The situation in the village was horrible, and news of the demons of the resistance gave the helpless people hope. Every few seconds a hunter neen would yank on the chains that secured the boy as their prisoner in an immature attempt to trip him as he walked. He never fell, but when he stumbled the headhunters would laugh. These men were obviously some of the Mizukage loyalists, the disgusting filth of the world all of them. The boy showed no fear, but that might have been because he was wearing a mask. His steps were heavy, like he was someone walking towards his destiny. Most of the gathered people thought that he was destined to die very soon. If they only knew. The blonde boy kept his head high, not allowing himself to look weak. A lot of the Kirinin, who stuck around for survival, respected him for that. The devil only knew what their monster of a leader would do to him. Even the civilians knew of the man's harsh punishments. Public executions were a popular practice, there had been five this month alone. The barbaric events would be carried out in the children's park in the middle of the village. It was an idea that the people liked as much as the old academy graduation test. 
The man had a heart on for incredibly horrible ideas. The boy was covered in what appeared to be inked symbols, a lot of them, all looking alike. The shinobi knew that they were chakra suppression seals, special seals made to lock away a person's chakra. The amount of them said that either Yugura was being overly cautious, or the blonde had incredible reserves. Both had an equal chance of being the reason coming from a man like the Mizukage. The man was so strange that not a single soul could guess what he was going to do next, he was all over the place when it came to the decisions he made. Some began to think that not even Yugura himself understood the reasoning behind some of his actions. The man was a certified sociopath. The thought that Kanoha had such a young child in the ranks of their ANBU was somewhat of a shock to the people of Kiri. The shinobi knew that the leaf produced more child prodigies than all of the other four combined. It was a known fact, Kanoha was on the top of the shinobi food chain, even after being attacked by the strongest of the bijou and losing their hokage. The loss of the yandame hokage had the other nations hoping that they could take up the mantle of the strongest, but with the god of shinobi still breathing. It was impossible to match the first of the ninja villages. Kiri had only vaguely knew about the happenings of the outside world, being in a civil war made it kind of hard to be up to date with foreign affairs. Even still, the death of a kage was always something that reached even the most secluded of places. The thing with Yugura was he didn't fear or respect the Lord Third Hokage, which was a fatal mistake. Every Kage had at least a little fear and some respect for the man. He was the third human ever to hold the title of God of Shinobi, along with the Rikudo Senin and Lord First Hokage, Senju Hashirama. He had held the longest time as a Kage in history, the only other man who was able to claim such achievements was the Sandame Suchikage, Anoki. For the Mizukage, who hadn't had much experience in anything but causing civil wars in his own nation, it was incredibly foolish on his part. Even in the presence of Akage and eight Hunter Nin, the blonde boy stood out most prominently. He had an air about him that caused all eyes to watch him. He was chained thoroughly, and had the most powerful shinobi in Kiri escorting him to the Hunter Nin headquarters to get information not only on the resistance, but Kanoha. That's why it confused the spectators, it felt like he was the one leading them to something. It was absurd, but that's the way he carried himself. All of this coming from a child made it even more disbelieving. Sometimes, the people of Kiri wondered how Yugura managed to become the man he was today. When he was elected to be the Mizukage, he was a kind person who cared very much about his nation. Now though, he was proving the people who thought a Jinchiriki shouldn't be in office correct. It was hard to not accept their words now, Yugura was the worst thing to happen to Mizuno Kuni. Ever. That wasn't saying that it was the bijou inside him causing all the trouble, but that's how a lot of people saw it. Something goes wrong with the Jinchiriki, blame the bijou. The boy was now almost out of sight for the citizens, but they could still tell that he was in their village. It was kind of scary that a boy could leave such a huge impression on people without saying a single word. He was no doubt one of the demons of the resistance. That was too bad, the people had hoped he would save them from Yugura's reign. Ah oh well, there was always the other one. A lot of people had thought the same thing. Hopefully he'll be the one. The Hunter Nin headquarters was a large underground fortress directly underneath the Mizukage's office. It served as both the interrogation center and the headhunter's base of operations. It served its purpose and nothing more. It was the picture of a perfect and strict militaristic building. Very fitting of Kirigakure, seeing as it was constantly involved in war, be it with other nations or itself. Currently, a mouse-masked, blonde boy was chained to a seat in the middle of a dark room in this building, his body covered in chakra-suppressing seals. Yugura, a man of small stature and messy light gray hair, don't forget his pink, poopyless eyes and stitch-like scar running down from his left eye, was standing in front of this masked blonde boy. His childlike appearance did nothing to decrease his powerful Kage presence. He had the eyes of a butcher, a monster, and the Mizukage didn't know, but the boy didn't like what his eyes were claiming to be. You know who I am, but I am afraid that I don't know a thing about you. Yugura coughed slightly. Besides the obvious Kanoha affiliation and Jinchiriki status. He added. Nazumi was silent for a second before he spoke, his head never changing its position. I am God's shadow. He whispered softly, yet everyone present in the room heard it clearly. You've angered my master, so he sent a real monster to cleanse this land of your tainted soul. The words were obvious to the Kage. There was only one man who never claimed to be a god, but was seen as one anyways. The Lord Third Hokage. Yugura was about to reply, but apparently the boy read his mind. You're looking at him. Yugura scoffed. You claim to be a monster while completely unable to move. 
The Sambai's Jinchiriki shook his head in disappointment. Such big words for my prisoner. He added. The boy must be delusional, there wasn't a bigger monster than himself. That thought was the man's fourth mistake. At the boy's silence, Yugura began again. I still don't know your name, boy. His voice showed annoyance. The kid was wasting his time with these word games. Are you going to tell it to me, or not? He asked with annoyance in his tone again. The man's feelings were very entertaining if nothing else for the boy. I will. He whispered again, and like the last time, the softness of it made it no less audible. Right before I kill you. He finished a moment later, just to get on the man's nerves some more. He didn't like Yugura already, but he had made it personal, with that monster remark. He took his title very serious, and this man had, in his mind, challenged him. The Mizukage sighed. Since you obviously do not wish to share any information with us willingly. I have no choice, but to have my men, take it from you forcefully. He was sure that if the boy was threatened with torture, that he'd break. Even if he was a Jinchiriki he was still a child, he had to be afraid of something. Or, so he thought. Oh, I'm willing to tell you everything you wish to know, actually. I'm just saving my name for the end. Mizumi replied in a relaxed voice. If Yugura wasn't so annoyed at the blonde then he would have noticed the strangeness of the boy's calm demeanor. He was a prisoner, in the heart of enemy territory, and in the presence of a Kage. Warning flags should have gone off at the beginning of the conversation. Apparently, the Uzumaki's plan to get under the man's skin was working beautifully. Yugura raised an eyebrow at that. Anything? He asked, his interest once again piqued. This boy was a Kanoha ANBU, who had gained the trust of Terumi Mei and her resistance, he had to have or she wouldn't have accepted his help. That meant that he had to know where his enemy was located and any future plans they may have. He was most definitely going to torture him for more information, but it helped if the person talked a little first. It was always helpful to know what to ask about. When the boy nodded, he continued. What is Terumi Mei's next plan? Couldn't hurt to ask and see if the boy was being truthful. She plans to come to Kiri. He answered quickly, causing Yugura to actually believe he was telling him the truth. What does she plan to do when she arrives? He asked immediately after, not wanting to waste his chance to learn what the woman was doing. He had only fought the woman once, and it ended in a draw. Someone with that kind of power was not someone the Mizukage could let live. Nazumi cocked his head to the side. To become the Godain Mizukage, of course. He said genuinely. Someone has to put Mizu no Kuni back together after you're no longer in this world. He continued. You know, because I'm going to kill you and all. He added quickly. He wanted to chuckle so badly at this moment. The little man was really annoyed with him now. Enough of this. I'm done with your little games. Yugura spat. I'm done offering you a chance to escape torture. He turned to leave his torture specialists and the two hunter teams that came here with him alone with the child. Ah, but that was never a possibility, now was it, Yugura? The blonde said before he could leave. Remember, you were most definitely going to torture me. He added emphasis on the two words he knew the man had thought. The Kage turned, his eyes narrowed. The boy had just, very subtly, hinted that he knew what he was thinking. It looks like I've got your attention now. Nazumi continued. Thankfully it would seem like even without him here to completely pull your strings like the puppet you are, you can still act like a real person. He added, confusing the man. Nothing could get past his sensory abilities. Nazumi could feel another presence manipulating the Mizukage. He couldn't feel the intruder exactly though, probably because the man wasn't anywhere near them. May had mentioned that she thought it might be possible for someone to be controlling Yugura. She thought it was too much of a personality change for the noble man with good intentions to become the thing he was now. More nonsense, boy? Yugura asked. I really haven't the time for this. If you have something to say, say it. The fact that the man was being manipulated didn't change what he was here to do. The Lord Third Hokage had ordered him to take the life of the Yande Mizukage, and he had a perfect, complete admissions record. He would have to tell his leader his findings though. Someone capable of controlling the mind of a powerful Kage who was also a Jinchiriki was a dangerous person. They needed to be prepared if the man decided he wanted to try Kanoha's Kage out next. It helped that he could tell that the small man had retained most of his personality, even with the man's control. It meant he really had challenged his monster status. 
he would enjoy proving the man wrong. All right then, straight to business. Nazumi said. You've made four mistakes, Mizukuchi-san. Yagura ignored the way he was addressed. Right now, he was more interested in what the boy thought he had done wrong. Oh? He asked. Please, enlighten me. He replied with mock curiosity. The man believed he was speaking with a regular child, even if he was a human sacrifice. You actually thought you captured me, making me your prisoner. He shook his head slightly. You were mistaken. You're trying to say you wanted to be captured? The Kage asked in a condescending tone. Forgive me if I don't believe you, boy. Nazumi was silent for a few seconds before he began. Then, you thought this number of seals could suppress my chakra. Those seals could hold me and half of my shinobi forces, combined. Yagura retorted. Even if you do contain the Kyubi, you do not have the ability to break free. After that, you said you were the better monster. This was said with a little anger, something his fellow Jinchuriki didn't miss. I don't care what you want to call yourself, kid. His tone now annoyed Nazumi. You're a prisoner. What you are no longer matters. The Uzumaki could tell he still felt like he was the greater monster. Now I'm done speaking with you. He said, making his way out of the room. He made it halfway out the door when he heard the boy speak again. I still haven't told you your fourth and most foolish mistake. Yugura made his way back to the boy, wanting to hear his final words, slipping his mask off to look him in the face, before he left. His eyes immediately widened when he saw the vicious smirk on the young face. That's when the seals decorating his body lit up, signaling their activation. The room shook and cracked under the pressure of the power the child was emitting, trying, and succeeding, to break from the suppression seals. One by one, the many tags burst, sending smoke into air, in an impossible show of strength. The blonde's eyes were a molten gold, staring straight into the man's soul. Yagura was the Mizukage, and the Jinchuriki, of the Sanbai. He wasn't scared easily. But when the boy next spoke, he was terrified. You fucked with Kanoha. In the blink of an eye, the now-awake Naruto was in front of Yugura, sending him through multiple walls with a single natural energy enhanced punch. He made sure the blow wouldn't kill him, it wouldn't be fun if he died right away. He wanted to play. The second his fist met the man's face, three of the hunter were on him, their kunai in hand. Their hands were outstretched to slice through him when they heard him whisper a god into existence. Bishamon. The golden form of the god of justice and war formed around their target, successfully blocking the blades just with his body. The thing was tangible. Wonderful. What the hell was this kid? Naruto didn't even turn to face the men behind him, he wasn't here to waste his time with these people. He'd get to them shortly. Instead, Bishamon turned, his entire body now facing the ten occupants of the room his master was previously imprisoned in. When the thing began to go through a series of hand seals, the men suddenly emitted the feeling of dread. Good. Naruto uttered the technique being used by the golden construct of natural energy. Katan, Gokaku no Jutsu, Fire Release. Great fireball technique. When the golden god brought his right hand to his mouth, the room, along with the men inside, were incinerated into nothingness by impossibly huge, white-hot flames. He didn't know, and really didn't care, but he had just produced the world's biggest fireball in history. He was a monster, he knew he was capable of feats no other could conceive of. Confidence, not arrogance. He could see the Mizukage stand from the rubble in the distance of the room he was slammed in. That meant the man wanted to play some more. Naruto was happy about his decision. Yugura took the staff-like pole he had on his back into his hand, letting Naruto get a better look at the uneven hooks at the end, and the green flower on the larger end. It was an odd weapon to use, but the blonde learned not to judge something on its appearance only. The Mizukage spun it in his hands for a moment, before he took off in the direction of the person who had the audacity to attack him in his own village. The Mizukage staff met Naruto's Tonto, in an impressive display of Kenjutsu, even if he wasn't using a sword, the hooks at the ends of the pole were close enough. Yugura was getting angry. With every strike, the blonde was able to parry it with one-handed ease. He was even putting all of his strength in every swing. It meant the boy was much stronger, and that was impossible. He was a Kage. He had more experience in combat than a child. Yet, he was being toyed with, like he was the less experienced. It really annoyed Yugura. The two broke off from their brief weapons duel, jumping back to a safer distance. I don't know how you did it, but you are still my prisoner, even if you are not chained. 
Naruto responded with a crazed smile, and a blue sphere began to come into existence in his right hand, causing Yagura to widen his eyes. He could tell that thing was made of pure chakra, and it would either severely wound or kill him if it found its mark. So when the boy rushed at him, intending to slam the ball of energy into him, he brought his staff up, ready to counter the boy's jutsu. Rasengan. Naruto howled, driving the Lord Fourth's technique at the Mizukage. Yagura smirked as he spoke. Suetun, Mizukagami, no jutsu. Out of the large, flat circular pool of water came a perfect copy of Naruto, down to the Rasengan and everything. It shocked Naruto for all of two seconds before he dismissed it and decided to test what this copy of him was made of. When their Rasengans met, Naruto was impressed that they were on the same scale, and effectively cancelled both jutsu. When the clash was overthrew, Yugura's copy of him, dispersed into water. Your abilities are nothing to me, boy. The Mizukage sneered. There is nothing you can throw at me that I can't toss right back. He added, his tone claiming he was the superior. Naruto smiled and then waved, disappearing in a puff of smoke. Yugura's eyes widened. The one he had been facing was only a Kagebunshin? Where was the real one then? He was informed of the boy's position when the back of his head was impacted by the blonde's foot. This kid was seriously fast, much faster than he was, or anyone he had ever met for that matter. He couldn't keep up with the fight as it was now. It didn't matter if he could cancel the ANBU's attacks if he couldn't react to them fast enough. He needed to change his tactics. He needed a game changer. He needed his bijou. The wild grin on Naruto's face was absolutely sinister. He really liked playing with other bijou. The red-black cloak that represented a tailed beast chakra began to flood Yugura's body, showing the world his exceptional control over the Sambai. Naruto knew the real reason though. The same man controlling the Mizukage's actions had also enthralled the bijou, making his cooperation with its host incredible. He had complete access to the giant turtle. The air was thick with the version 2's transformation, complete. An actual weight was bearing down on all of Kiri. White eyes bore into gold ones, through a vicious miasma of scarlet and black, searching for any kind of fear in the Kanohanin. He knew the boy was a Jinchuriki, but his control over the Bija should have struck fear into anyone. It made the water shadow nervous that the boy was so collected, even when staring what looked like a demon in the eyes. He decided to ignore his feelings and attack the boy with all of his might. The three-tailed, version two form shot from his position at Naruto, pulling his arm back to strike with enough force to shatter entire buildings. This had killed every shinobi who tried to block, thinking they were physically stronger than he was with the Sanbai's chakra surrounding him in the demonic shroud. So imagine his surprise when the boy caught his enhanced punch with enough force that blew out the wall, behind the blonde. Even more surprising was when he tried to retract his fist, he couldn't get out of the blonde's grip. The Sanbai's chakra didn't even burn him, which he guessed made sense since he, too, was a Jinchuriki. But the boy's physical strength, even with the QB helping him, which he could tell was not happening at the moment, shouldn't have made it possible to hold him back with little effort. What are you? The deep and intimidating voice, coming from the transformed Yugura, asked, in awe. This child couldn't be human, not with this kind of power. The smirk he received, was unsettling. I'm a real monster. He said, before letting go of the man's fist and slamming a kick in his head, sending his fellow Jinchuriki sailing. Before he could impact with anything, Naruto was behind him and slammed another kick into his chin, sending Yagura into the ceiling this time, crashing his way to the surface. The sight of Kirigakure's Mizukage and his beige cloak being thrown from his own office forcefully was seen by many. The blonde boy who was thought to be the leader's prisoner came from the building next, the obvious assailant. It caused the people watching to hold their breath in anticipation. What was going on? Once the bijou enhanced Mizukage hit the ground, he took off for Naruto again, this time intent on hitting him with a Sangosho to slow his movement. Just like last time though, he wasn't fast enough and ended up receiving another powerful kick, sending him flying away from the village. This was Naruto's plan. He needed to be alone for his secondary task, and too many lives would be taken if they started their death match in the heart of the village. He wanted Mei to have something to lead afterwards, and destroying Mizu no Kuni's hidden village and its people would be counterproductive. Yagura roared in anger. The boy was playing with him and he was still dominating the fight, completely. He wanted to change that. When Naruto saw the Mizukage begin his bijou mode transformation, he was ecstatic. He hadn't fought a bijou in years, and the last time he did, it was so much fun. The thought of taking a tailed beast on head-to-head -head was something most people would fear, and try their best to avoid. 
Naruto was the farthest thing from normal though, and he loved the idea of doing the impossible. Everyone had a hobby, and that was his. The giant turtle bijou appeared on the outskirts of Kiri, in all its glory. The shell of the beast was a dark gray, with spikes standing up all around its body, promising pain to all who got too close. Underneath, the shell was a dark red or maroon color, as was the only eye he had opened, the iris being a dark orange and the pupil the same maroon. Its three tails swayed back and forth in the air while he observed his newest opponent. Yagura was still in charge, his mind the dominant in the transformation. So he still possessed the rage he had toward the boy for making him look like he couldn't handle himself against a mere child. Without preamble, the form of the sambai shifted into that of a ball-like shape, shooting itself at the blonde, with incredible speed. In his head, Yugura had been absolutely livid. He was going to show the child what a real monster looked like. That was a big no-no. With a shout of effort, Naruto met the spinning form of the bald sambai with nothing but his own fist. For a second, the Mizukage had thought the boy was foolish to try and challenge the powerful attack from the gigantic being. He then realized that he was the fool. He never even had a chance. This wasn't even a real fight. You needed two for that, and Yugura was obviously the only one trying. With an impossible display of godlike strength, the Mizukage in his bija mode was stopped in his tracks, and then shot even further from Kiri than they already were. The blow was the most devastating thing he had ever felt, and he was cursing the gods that he was still conscious, because what came next was even worse. Yugura had angered Naruto, actually angered him, and caused the blonde to forego his decision, to hold back. He was full of natural energy, and Bija Chakra raced around his body in an excited manner. He had felt the man's mind, and what he heard caused him to snap. No. Now Naruto was going to show him what a monster could do. The Sambai was laid on its back, still trying to recover from the powerful punch. With brute strength that would cause Tsunade to gulp, Naruto took hold of the bijou and threw him into the sky above. He was not finished. When Jiraiya had taught him the Rasengan, he had mentioned that it was incomplete. The Yandame apparently wanted to add a nature chakra to the technique, but died before he could. The Toad Sage had tried for many years to complete his student's prized jutsu, but was never able to. It was incredibly difficult. Naruto really loved his wind affinity. The screeching wind signaled the new variant of the Rasengan. Blades of wind rotated around a grinding ball of energy, screaming to be let loose. And let loose it was. Futon, Raisin Shuriken. The destructive spinning sphere was hurled into the beast's back, blasting it even higher in the sky. He was not finished. In the next blink, Naruto was above the tailed beast now, with two Raisin Shurikens this time, one in each hand. Futon, Tsuin Raisin Shuriken, Wind Release. Twin Raisin Shuriken. He shouted as he shot both of the powerful versions of the Raisin he had created at the Bijou who was still being buffeted in his back by the first one. When the twin spears met the Sambai's body, he was crushed on both sides for a moment, before the two overpowered the one, forcing the Bijou back down to the ground with an earth-shattering crash. He was not finished. Bishamon. He shouted, the god coming into the world with his words. This time though, the god's body had something it never did before. Naruto willed himself to stay in the sky, golden wings, now protruding from his powerful sage dust technique. Not wasting any time, Naruto continued his assault. Senpo, Kami no Mijite, Sage Art. The right hand of God. With all of the might he could muster, he dove from his spot in the sky like the warrior of God he was and slammed the powerful fist of a Kami into the Sanbai. Officially ending his wave of carnage upon the Mizukage. Now he was almost finished. Naruto landed on the ground next to the crater the Bijou was smashed into, letting Bishamon take his leave, back to the heavens to sit amongst the gods again. Yugura began to revert back to his human shape, no longer capable of holding Bija mode. The Uzumaki jumped into the crater, to stand over the fallen Kage. He needed to tell the man one last thing, before he allowed him to die. He crouched down so that he could speak these words into his opponent's ear. Take this with you into the pure world. He whispered. My name is Uzumaki Naruto, and when I'm finished here, he waved one arm into the sky to elaborate, I can't wait to play over on that side. He finished. Yugura's last thoughts before the blonde boy he now knew to be Naruto snapped his neck were of acceptance. He had met a real monster. The sound of the Yande Mizukage's neck snapping filled the crater, announcing, finally, the fall of Yugura. It was now time for Naruto to start his second task. 
After Naruto was completely finished with Yugura, he went straight to the resistance, eager to let them know that the war they had fought in for years was finally over. It didn't take him very long, and he was immediately assaulted with cheers from the people, nods of approval from his team, and a nice big kiss from Mei, which had Sara gaping in shock. At first, he was angry that Mei declined him so many times for a ten-year-old. But then he quickly reminded himself that his ten-year-old hero had scored with one of the hottest women he had ever seen. This kid was a god among men in the eyes of the Nara ANBU operative. It all happened very fast. One moment, they were celebrating the death of a madman, and the next, they were watching the people of Kiri greet Nazumi and Mei. Nazumi knew that the mass majority of Mizu no Kuni would accept Mei with open arms as their new Mizukage. The woman had led the resistance for years trying to free her country. She was seen as a hero, and honestly the only person who was good enough for the job. Nazumi was fine with some praise, but when an entire village regards you as their liberator it gets to be a little too overwhelming. The waves of thanks and gratitude he was feeling from the Kiri people almost caused him to flee. But in the end he stood his ground, not wanting to show any kind of weakness to the hidden village. He had to keep Kanoha's reputation intact. May had given off the feeling of immense gratitude and even disbelief. The crater they found the dead body of Yugura in was extreme in size, and she wasn't sure if she wanted to know what caused it. It scared her somewhat to know that Naruto could take Abijah down all by himself. But for some reason she didn't find herself thinking any differently about the blonde. He was someone she had come to trust completely in the small amount of time she knew him. Rohan knew their young comrade could do it, but gave off the feeling of pride. It wasn't every day a ten-year-old took down a Kage, who was a Jinchuriki, to boot. Sara worshipped him even more than he used to, which was partly because of his win over Yugura, and partly because of his win over Mei. Nazumi knew that he thought there was some kind of sexual conquest involved with their relationship and he was going to try and convince the pervert that that was not the truth. Even though he knew it would be futile. Karasu was proud of his friend, but kept silent, knowing that he could feel his feelings. Nico had thought the most about his actions. The captain was very pleased with the effectiveness of her Kohai's actions. He had eliminated his target and kept the village out of danger. There were no unwanted casualties whatsoever, which showed the resistance how good Kanoha was at what they did. That, however, was not the biggest emotion she felt. Nazumi was happy to know that Nico didn't just see him as a subordinate, but almost like a little brother. She was extremely grateful and relieved that he came back unhurt and safe. He had found someone he might be able to call family in the future. Having an older sister sounded like fun to him. As Nazumi walked side by side with Mei, he felt something he had never felt before. He had freed a country smothered in war from an oppressive leader, and that felt amazing. He was a monster to the enemy, but to the citizens, he was a hero. He had unintentionally become his hero, the Lord Fourth Hokage. Again, time passed quickly, and Mei was already the Mizukage. It had only been two days, and the people knew what they wanted. The woman would lead them into a peaceful era, which they deserved. It was the day when Mei would speak to Kirigakure. On top of the Mizukage building, Mei stood in her full Kage robes, about to address her people. To her right was Nazumi and Karasu, the two who helped liberate the country the most. To her right was Ao, her right hand since the civil war started. Behind her were the village elders. Even they welcomed Mei as the new Mizukage. It seemed Yugura had little support in his crusade against bloodline users. Mei brought her hand into the air, silencing the crowd that showed up. Kiri, I am Tarumi Mei, and I am your Godain Mizukage. She announced. A wave of cheer and applause resounded throughout Kirigakure. Again, she silenced them with a hand. Our country has seen much sadness throughout this war, and I am overjoyed to say the war is no more. This time, when the cheer and applause came, it was much louder. And Nazumi could feel the happiness from the entire village. May let the sounds quiet on their own. When they did, she continued. My resistance stood against Yugura and his barbaric teachings, so today, here and now, I promise you that all of Mizu no Kuni will see peace. I'm already sending peace treaties to other hidden villages, so we never have to see unnecessary war again. The village was silent, but Nazumi could feel the gratitude the villagers felt for May. She was their savior. Or, one of them. Now, I'd like to introduce two young men who helped free our nation. May said, getting all of the gathered people's utmost attention. These two are not even from our country, but they risked their lives to save us. She continued, a smile appearing on her face. 
Without them, this war would not have ended so soon. She brought her arm out in a welcoming position, telling Nizumi and Karasu to join her. I'd like to formally thank you, Karasu of Kanoha. You have done my country an incredible service. I am in your debt. Cheers rang out through the village. This was one of the demons of the resistance, someone who everyone that disliked Yugura wanted to meet. Like his partner, it was easy to tell he was still very young as well, which made him even more popular. Karasu bowed his head to the Mizukage, showing Kanoha's respect to the new hidden village they were going to be allied with. The next person I'd like to introduce is this young operative, Nazumi, of Kanoha. May said, pointing at the blonde ANBU. This boy brought us hope when we thought it was all but lost. The crowd remained silent through their new Mizukage words. He single-handedly raised Black Harbor to the ground, freeing the innocent men and women that were wrongly imprisoned there. She smiled while she said these next words. And he ended the cruel reign of Yugura not three days ago, all for the sake of freeing our people. Kanoha has shown that it is a village worth befriending. She put a hand on Nazumi's shoulder and smiled. Kirigik your no sato, I give you the bringer of hope. She finished, allowing what seemed like the entire country to cheer for their savior. And that's how the monster became the hero. This was all for now. Thank you for watching, I hope you liked it and that you will be back for more. Please like, share and subscribe. See ya.